you, church. Um, it's so good to be with you all this morning. One of the things that I love about church is that no matter what kind of week I've had, even if it's been a rubbish week or bad things have happened or um, I'm just in a bad mood, I come to church and I'm reminded of all the things that we have to be thankful for for all the good things that God gives us, and for all the things that he teaches us, for all the things he's done for us, and for all the promises that he makes about our future. So I thought we could start today um, by sharing things that we're thankful for this week. Um, so I want you to just like either put your hand up or shout it out. Don't be quiet because that's awkward. Um, what things are you thankful for this week? Holiday. Holiday, yes. Anything else? Yeah? Alton Towers. Did you go to Alton Towers? Wow, nice. Cinema, yes, Mark. Food. Food, yeah. A retro dome, cool. Played some games. Yeah, any others? Health, yeah. George? Friendship. Friendship, yeah, Ruth? Good one, good one. Sammy? Trampoline park. People have a good week, yeah? River? Swimming. Swimming, yeah. It sounds like you guys have had a great week. Um, well, let me say thank you for all of those things now. Let's, let's pray. Um, Father God, thank you so much for all of those things, um, for swimming, for trampoline parks, for health, for family, and for cars that keep us dry. Father, thank you for all the good things that you've given us um, this week, and thank you so much that you've brought us here to church to be with your people and to hear your word and to be reminded of even more good things this morning. Amen. Um, now, there are lots of things, lots of uh, reasons in the world to be sad. There's struggle and pain and brokenness, and sometimes all of that stuff can overwhelm us. But as Christians, we have hope even in the sadness and brokenness. We have so many reasons to feel rubbish in this, in this world and in this life, but we have even more reasons to be thankful and even more reasons to praise God, um, especially because as Christians, we have Jesus. Um, so we're going to stand now and sing together 10,000 Reasons, which is a song all about those reasons we have to praise God. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, O oh my soul, worship His holy name. Sing like never before, O oh my soul, I'll worship Your holy name. The sun comes up, it's a new day dawning. It's time to sing your song again. Whatever may pass and whatever lies before me, let me be singing when the evening comes. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, O oh my soul, worship His holy name. Sing like never before, O oh my soul, I'll worship Your holy name. Rich in love and you're slow to anger. Your name is great and your heart is kind. For all your goodness I will keep on singing. Ten thousand reasons for my heart to find. His holy name Sing like never before Oh my soul I'll worship your holy name And on that day 
When my strength is failing, the end draws near, and my time has come. Still my soul will sing your praise unending. Ten thousand years and then forever. His holy name Sing like never before Oh my soul I'll worship your holy name One of the things that I'm really thankful for is Holiday Club. Is anyone here going to be at Holiday Club? Put your hand up if you're going to be at Holiday Club. Lots of people, lots of people are going to be at Holiday Club. Um, we've got, I think, about 28 kids out of 30 signed up so far. Um, so praise God for that. Um, and keep praying that a couple more kids will sign up um, and pray for those kids who will be there. Um, there's so many kids going to come to Holiday Club that don't know Jesus, um, that have maybe never heard the gospel. So let's pray um, that they will come and hear that they'll have a great time and let's pray that um, people will be saved um, and then another thing that I'm really thankful for this isn't a notice this is just something nice that I did yesterday um, I'm really thankful for sunflowers sunflowers are my favorite flower and yesterday I went to a place in Doncaster um, where you could pick your own sunflowers um, it was very fun um, now I really love sunflowers and one cool thing about them is they start really small like this tiny little seed that you can't even see um, this tiny little seed here's, here's a bag of them there you go like a little tiny seed um, but they grow really tall really really tall um, okay maybe if you're a kid right stand up stand up if you're a kid and then go down really small pretend you're a sunflower seed and then grow really tall <laughs> Good job, <laughs> good job. Um, some flowers start really small, but they grow really tall. And in today's bit of the Bible that we're going to be reading, we're going to see that God's kingdom is like a tiny little seed that started really small, but it's growing really big. And one day it's going to be huge. It started with just one baby born in a manger who grew up to be a man and that man was Jesus and he went and he told everyone believe in me and have life forever and more people start to believe and then they told more people and they start to believe and they told more people and the good news of Jesus spread and his kingdom grew um, until one day someone told you and you believed um, and now there's people all over the world who are all believing in Jesus um, and it's very exciting um, now, one thing that we do as a church um, almost every week is we say something called the creed. The creed is just when we say what we believe as Christians. And the cool thing, I think one of the really cool things about the creed is that today, loads of Christians all around the world, in all different countries, from all different backgrounds, they'll wake up today and they'll go to church and they'll say the same creed that we're about to say. So it can feel kind of small, right? We can feel like, oh, we're the only Christians. Like, we'd hardly know any other Christians. We're so small, especially like here in Kendry, there's all these um, people and just, just us that believe in Jesus. But actually, there's so many people all over the world who will be saying the same creed that we're about to say um, together now. So we're going to say it together. Um, but while we say the creed, I want you to be thinking of all those other Christians around the world that are saying the same thing and believing the same thing. Think about how big God's kingdom is. Seems small, but really it's big and it's growing. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under the rule of Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. 
He was cut off from God. On the third day, he rose again. He returned to heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Christian church worldwide, the local fellowship of believers, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body to eternal life. Amen. Please take a seat. Now, God's kingdom is a bit like sunflowers. It started small, but it's growing, and one day it will be huge. But God's kingdom is not made of flowers, obviously. It's made of people. People who know that they're sinners and know that they need to be forgiven by Jesus. That's the thing that we have in common. That's what it means to be part of God's kingdom, to be forgiven by Jesus. And so another thing that we do at church every week is we confess our sin. We say sorry um, for all the ways that we haven't followed Jesus. Um, And so that's what we're going to do now. We're going to confess our sins together and ask Jesus to forgive us. Um, so take just, just a few seconds to think back over the week. Think of all the ways um, where we haven't lived up to God's standard. Um, and then I'll say the words in normal type, and you can join in with the words in bold. And the words are just forgive us and help us, so if you can't read, you can still join in. God our Father, we are sorry for our sins, for turning away from you and ignoring your rule. Father, in your mercy, forgive us and help us. For behaving just as we wish, without thinking of you. Father, in your mercy, forgive us and help us. For failing you by what we do and think and say. Father, in your mercy, forgive us and help us. For letting ourselves be pulled away from you by temptations and the world around us. Father, in your mercy, forgive us and help us. For sometimes being ashamed of Jesus. Father, in your mercy, forgive us and help us. Please, Father, forgive us by the death of your Son and strengthen us every day to live as your children by the power of your Holy Spirit. Amen. Um, Now, Mary is going to continue to lead us in prayer um, on a video. Uh, This is from John 1, 1 to 2, just a little um, passage. In the beginning was the Word, And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Let us pray. Father God, thank you that we can look to you in confidence. We know, Lord, that only you, in only that, sorry, uh, we know, Lord, that only in you we can find security and renewed strength in a world where sometimes we feel lost. We are comforted because of your gracious love. <sighs> Sorry. And care. To our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Father, we know that we have the confidence that whatever we face, that you are with us. Father God, thank you for your word. Please help us to live the way of your word. Restore in the way the joy of your salvation and grant us a willing spirit to sustain us. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Lord, for the unity all believers can enjoy in you. Help us, Lord, to serve together as equal members of your body. We know, Lord, that unity in Christ breaks down barriers and builds our church. Father God, we know we often do things that upset you. Father, please forgive us and help us. We were enslaved in our sin and deceived by our sinful nature. Please, Lord, help us to never, ever forget the love and kindness of God our Saviour, who saved us through your mercy of rebirth by the Holy Spirit, poured out for us so generously through Jesus Christ our Lord. Father, may we always, always put you first and others before ourselves. In Jesus' name we pray, for your grace and for your glory. Amen. Thanks so much, Mary. Um, 
Another thing about sunflowers is that they need sun to grow and have life. Without the sun, they would die. And that's another way that God's kingdom is kind of like sunflowers. Um, we we don't, maybe don't need the sun, but we need Jesus to grow and have life. Without him, we die. We can't do it on our own. We need Jesus. Um, so we're going to sing a song now called Everybody Needs Jesus. I don't think that we've actually sung it out loud yet, but we've listened to it before at church, so you should be familiar with it. Um, let's stand and sing Everybody Needs Jesus. chapter 13 and we're going to read just a few verses, verses 31 to 35. He told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed which a man took and planted in his field. Though it is the smallest of all your seeds, yet when it grows it is the largest of garden plants and becomes a tree so that the birds of the air come and perch in its branches. He told them still another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like yeast that a woman took and mixed into a large amount of flour until it worked all the way through the dough. Jesus spoke all of these things to the crowd in parables. He did not say anything to them without using a parable. So was fulfilled what was spoken through the prophet. 
I will open my mouth in parables. I will utter things hidden since the creation of the world. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Um, thinking about, like Holly's already teed up for us with the sunflowers, uh, small beginnings. So I'm going to show you a picture of something that's relatively small, and then it's going to become something much bigger. And I want you to see if you can guess what these things turn into. Okay, so here's your first one. Okay, a chicken. Yep, it might help if I show you the scale of that egg. That's the actual egg. There you go. So, yeah, an ostrich. So there you go. But I didn't actually realize how massive ostriches are. If you look at that, that's uh, your average sized man. Um, and yeah, an ostrich is about twice as big. And look at the size of its body as well. It's massive. Okay, uh, so that is nine foot tall or so, an ostrich, uh, like me, but with someone on my shoulders if you struggle to imagine. Um, but unlike me, they grow to that size in two to four years. That's pretty big growth, that. Um, so, uh, another one, slightly weirder this time. Um, any ideas what that is? Jellyfish, he's got it in one. That weird, little, uh, that weird little sack thing turns into a jellyfish. But that one wouldn't turn into just your normal jellyfish that you might be worried about running into uh, in just off the coast. That is the kind of jellyfish that that turns into. That, uh, apparently, I thought this was um, like a perspective trick to start with. The, div the diver was dead close and the jellyfish was far away, so it looks bigger. But apparently that's how big they are. Uh, it's called a lion's mane jellyfish. It's one of the biggest ones in the world. Their tentacles can grow to up to 120 feet in length. That's, again, I'll use me as, a, as an example. That's 20 of me lay head to toe. Um, that's how long those tentacles grow. Uh, all from that weird little egg, that sack thing. I don't know. Uh, thankfully, they don't live anywhere near the UK. Uh, how about this one? This one's a little bit more obscure. Um, we're talking about that little rock thing that you can see just up there. Any idea what that is the start of? No, I've got you with this one. Yeah. Nope. I suppose it's technically not that little rock. It's the bit that's directly underneath the rock. And that is the start of a river. It's not just any river. That tiny little thing becomes the Thames. Okay, that is the source of the River Thames. It's in the Cotswolds. That's Thames Head. Uh, it's 97 miles from London. And the River Thames is 205 miles long. It holds four and a half billion uh, gallons of water. So that tiny little thing, again, massive, massive growth. I don't have a comparison with me for that one. It's a bit too big. Um, next one. You know, graph, couldn't resist chucking a graph in, bit of maths. Okay, what's that showing? Any ideas? Population, yep, specifically, that is, over the last, looks like four, five hundred years, the population of Sheffield. And you see it started way down, it's basically on zero there, maybe slightly higher than zero, a couple of hundred. Uh, but then that has grown up to, it says, 600,000. That's the population of Sheffield. I couldn't find one for Barnsley, sadly, but according to the Doomsday Book, uh, which is something that William the Conqueror put together um, in the, the 11th century, there were 200 people living in a place called Burnersley. So you know those vans that drive around, the council vans that have Burnsley homes, that's where that name's come from. Uh, there was 200 people in a place near Silkston, um, and that's now grown to what we know as Barnsley, uh, and that's a quarter of a million people these days. Um, so a thousand years in the making, but again, amazing growth. There's three and one for this one. Three garages. Any ideas? What's that become? What's that grown to? The garages themselves haven't grown. I'll say that. The garages are still the same size. They might be knocked down, I don't know. It's not what's built on it. It's what started inside those garages. Not cars, even. Bigger than that. So those three companies, Sean knew she didn't get there in time. Those three garages, the one on the left, was where Apple started. Steve Jobs started Apple in that garage. Google and Amazon. And today, they are worth a combined $5.8 trillion. 
Um, so amazing things can begin in a garage or a shed. If you've, got a, if you've got a shed and an idea, who knows where you could be in 20 years' time. Uh, one more, and uh, this one, I, well, I do have a picture, but I've actually got uh, a prop for it as well. And I've also given each of you a prop. This was actually, this thing was so small that it was on your chair when you came in. Every single one of you, you've probably sat on it. It's so small, it's insignificant. You don't know, Mary's having a look. You might have knocked it on the floor, I don't know. I'll hold one up for you. You see that? Nope, I'm not surprised. It is, not a surprise, a mustard seed. Okay, so it's so small. You find it on that chair, Elizabeth? Yep, tiny little one there. You've each sat on one this morning. It is a mustard seed. You might have seen it coming. Um, but as Jesus tells us in our passage today, that if you took, if you managed to find it from where you sat, and you took it home and planted it in your garden, eventually, it would become the biggest thing in your garden. Three metres tall again, so about the same size as the ostrich, uh, but certainly a lot wider um, and, and bigger. Uh, now, if you've been here in previous weeks, you'll know that Jesus isn't just testing their knowledge of plants and trees and such. In fact, there's probably going to be of mustard trees growing around nearby when Jesus was talking, so he'd have been able to point them out. No, in fact, uh, Jesus is speaking in parables again. And as we remember from, if you've been here in previous weeks, they're stories with meanings. Meanings that if we listen to and understand, they'll reveal great secrets about God's kingdom for us. So let's pray as we begin uh, that God would help us to do that. Dear God, thank you for these parables and the secrets that they reveal. As we hear more this morning, please would you give us listening ears and hungry hearts, keen to know you more and to be changed by the truths we hear. Please help me to speak faithfully. And in Jesus' name we ask. Amen. Amen. So it's a small passage today, only five verses, uh, but we get two parables for the price of one. It's a twofer. Uh, we're going to look at them one at a time. And the first one tells us that the kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed. And we've touched on this already this morning. That small beginnings lead to enormous growth. Okay, in verse, have a look at it again, verse 31, if you've still got the passage open, I'll read it for us. It says, he told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed, which a man took and planted in his field. Though it's the smallest of all seeds, yet when it grows, it is the largest of garden plants and becomes a tree, so that the birds come and perch in its branches. Now, a mustard seed is very, very small. You couldn't even see it when I held it up. You didn't even see it on your chairs. In those days, it was one of the smallest things around. I couldn't even find a jar of them in Tesco. I had to get Joanna to go and find them for us. There you go. There's probably a few thousand of them in there. Okay. But in Jesus' day, everyone knew what they were. They were a common item in the kitchen. Uh, and it was even used as a saying for something really tiny and insignificant. Apparently... One of the ones that we've got here as well are a little bit bigger. They've been maybe genetically modified or something. They're bigger nowadays. I don't know why. But the point is, we're talking about something ridiculously tiny. But, as Jesus says, if you go home and plant it and look after it, it will become the biggest thing in your garden. The one tree that all the birds go to, to have a perch. And Jesus says that's what the kingdom of heaven's like. It starts tiny, but with phenomenal growth. At this point in Matthew's Gospel, the Kingdom of Heaven was about 13 people. Jesus and the disciples. Maybe a few more here and there, but still enough people to fit in one small room. A few months later, it had gotten even smaller. One man dying on a cross. No followers in sight, an insignificant looking mustard seed. But the parable doesn't end there. It wouldn't be a very good parable, would it? The, the kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed, small and insignificant, the end. That is how the kingdom of heaven starts, not where it ends. Three days later, Jesus appeared to a small group of women and then the disciples, and that brings the number back up to 15 or 20 again. 40 days later, that number has grown to 120. Then at Pentecost, it grew again to 3,000. And from there, the gospel went out to Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, areas, then Ethiopia, a whole country, and Turkey and the Mediterranean, eventually reaching Rome and Spain. And after 300 years, there were roughly 34 million Christians. And that was just half of the Roman Empire. 
the biggest empire the world had ever seen at that point. Today, 2.4 billion people across the world call themselves Christians. Now, even if you're suspicious about that number in the surveys that get it, just dividing that by 10 still leaves us with an eye-wateringly massive number, and it's still growing. In Africa, for instance, 100 years ago, there were about 8 million Christians in the whole continent. Today, there's about 390 million. Okay, that's grown about 50 times. It's expected that by 2025, so just another four years, that will have almost doubled again to 600 million. According to uh, Operation World, Iran is the eighth hardest country in the world to be a Christian in terms of persecution. But Iran also has one of the fastest growing evangelical movements in the world. 20 years ago in the, col in the whole country, 20 years ago, about the turn of the, turn of the century, there was about 5,000 Christians. And today, that number is somewhere between 800,000 and a million. That is massive growth. Let's pray for the same here. And I could keep going. I could keep listing these numbers and these examples from all over the world. The stories of phenomenal growth. By being in the kingdom of heaven, you see, we are part of something that is the biggest and the most important thing in global history. It's not only massive, but it's still growing as well. It's unstoppable. And it's going to last forever. Not like earthly kingdoms. Now, I don't know about you, but I find this massively encouraging. Probably because, if I'm honest, being in the kingdom of heaven doesn't often feel like that. Outside of church, it's easy to think that we're the only followers of Jesus in the world. We don't hear about it on the news. You won't learn about it in schools. You don't get any notifications about it on your phone. As far as the world is concerned, the gospel and the kingdom of heaven is at the bottom of the list of relevant topics or issues. But this passage should hopefully help recalibrate us in the way we think. See, Matthew's gospel is written as like a training manual for Christians as we try and make more disciples of Jesus. At the end of Matthew's gospel, we get these words from Jesus, and they're coming on the screen now. Jesus came to them and said, All authority on heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, and surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. See, not only are we part of the biggest kingdom ever on earth, but it's got Jesus as its king. He's in charge, and he's promised that he'll always be with us. So no matter how small or insignificant we might feel, let's keep going, knowing that the kingdom is growing and it can't be stopped. This is also uh, an encouragement to us following the message we heard last week. If you weren't here, the parable of the wheat and the weeds is either side of this passage. We skipped over this one last week. And we saw that there's two kinds of people, those who are in the kingdom of heaven, people who love and trust Jesus, and people who aren't, and are so they are heading for hell. It left quite a lot of us feeling uncomfortable, to say the least, especially thinking about friends and family members who don't yet know Jesus. But the kingdom is growing. And as people hear about Jesus, weeds can become wheat. In fact, the very fact that Jesus hasn't returned yet means that there's still more people to come in. There's more growing to do. And every day that we wake up and find that Jesus hasn't returned yet is another day that more people are coming into the kingdom to know Jesus. Even the pandemic couldn't stop it, could it? At times when all the churches were closed and we were forced online onto YouTube, Hundreds and hundreds of people still heard the gospel for the first time. And they decided to follow Jesus. God was still growing the kingdom. So let's keep going. Keep sowing the seed and keep praying that it would find good soil, as we saw a few weeks ago. And that as we share God's word, people's hearts would receive it and repent and believe in Jesus. So the first parable we had in the first couple of verses, that deals with the size of the kingdom. Small beginnings lead to enormous, unstoppable growth. However, the second parable isn't just about the size of the kingdom, but also about its influence. And it goes even further in encouraging us as we seek to grow the kingdom. Have a look at verse 33. I'll read it for us again. He told them still another parable. 
The kingdom of heaven is like yeast that a woman took and mixed into a large amount of flour until it worked all through the dough. So second, the kingdom of heaven is like yeast. And God's word works for powerful transformations. So the words that Jesus uses here literally mean she took the yeast and she hid it inside the dough. Okay, You wouldn't know that it's there. Yeast, by the way, if you don't know, if you're a bit dense about these things like me, it makes the bread rise. So it doesn't stay flat in the dough. It makes it big and fluffy like the, the, the loaves that we can share around. Now, I've been busy this week. And as you can see, I have two batches of dough here. Okay, uh, One of them has got yeast in and one of them hasn't. I want you to see, can you tell which is which? Okay. A few shakes of the head. No, no baking experts amongst us. Great. Well, full disclosure, uh, I don't actually... Joanna made these. Um, I don't know how to, and so even I don't know which one has the yeast in it. Okay? It's unrecognisable, at least to start with, until you bake it. I wanted to do a Blue Peter style. Here's one I made earlier, but we've established I'm no Paul Hollywood. Uh, so, instead, I went to Tesco, and we've got... This and if I can open them, I'm not open them. Them, you can see. Now, which one of these do you think has yeast in? <laughs> this one. It's pretty obvious, isn't it? Pretty obvious which one has the yeast in and what the yeast has done as well. It's had a transformation. Without the yeast, you can't tell. But the yeast, when we've baked it, and over time, has had an effect. You didn't see the yeast, but you saw the difference. The transformation that it powered. Just a little bit of yeast. In fact, I've also got... I've almost lost it, it's so small. The amount of yeast that it would take to make that difference. It's that much. Okay? Tiny little amount of yeast makes a huge difference difference. In fact, the amount that the passage here is talking about, depending on which translation you've got, says it's about 30 kilograms of yeast. That's 40 of these. Or if you're struggling to imagine still what that is, that's about a bath full of bread. Okay? And the amount that you'd need for that is that much. Okay? So a tiny amount of yeast transforms the whole batch. And this is the second picture that Jesus, Jesus uses to describe the kingdom of heaven. Yeast a tiny amount makes a huge difference. Powering enormous growth, like we saw from the mustard seed, from 12 disciples to two and a half billion believers. They changed the world. But the parable of the East is talking about more than just the size of the kingdom. See, the power of the kingdom of heaven is in God's word. Like we saw in the parable of the sower, it's, God, it's God's word that gets sown. And like yeast, when God's word gets inside, it powers an amazing transformation. Sometimes quickly, sometimes slowly, but sure enough, the word of God makes a difference. It transforms people, changing us from the inside. Now, there's thousands of books and videos and seminars that people buy into to try and change themselves for the better. So they have all, each author claims they've found the secret, and, they've, and you can too change your life in just five easy steps. Uh, they've got dramatic titles like the ones you see up there, The Power of Now and The Magic of Thinking Big. This industry, this self-help industry, is apparently worth $13 billion dollars. And it doesn't work. It might help some people a little bit, but only Jesus has the real key. And he gives it away for free, here. Lasting, transformative power comes from taking God's word to heart and letting it change you from the inside out. If you're a Christian, then you're here today because God's word has had an effect in, in your life. I've been a member of this church for about seven years now, and it's been such a joy seeing how God has changed people to make him more like himself through his word. And that's often encouraged me as well to want to see more change in myself. Take some time this week and think about it. Where would you actually be without God, the influence of God's word in your life? 
What difference can you see? And as Holly encouraged us to earlier, thank God for it. It might actually be the kind of thing that's easier to see in other people. And if that's the case, then great, share that with other people. Share it with them during the week or over a cup of tea. Encourage each other with the ways that God is growing us, changing us by his word. You could think about the difference God's words made since you very first came to to follow Jesus. It might have been one year ago. It might have been 50 years ago. Or think about the difference that God's word has made just over the last year, over the COVID time. You could just think about the difference he's made this week. See, the picture of bread and yeast isn't really perfect. See, I could throw throw some more yeast on top of this bread, but it won't make a difference. It's done. That bread's finished. But the more we receive and dwell on God's word in our lives, the more he will transform us more and more each day to be like Christ. 2 Timothy 3 verse 16, I've got some verses on the, on the screen for us, tells us that all scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting and training in righteousness so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. And Hebrews 4 verse 12 tells us that God's word is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. So yes, there are words of great comfort in God's word, but when we open it, we should also expect it to challenge us, to change us and to cause us to grow. None of that's easy. God's word often cuts deep and it exposes things about ourselves that we'd prefer not to admit or face up to. But it also gives us the power to change by the help of God's spirit to be more like Jesus and to increase our joy in him as well as we do so. Just recently we were looking at 1 John together and John wrote encouraging Christians that their faith in Jesus was genuine and time and time again he did that by pointing to the fruit in their lives. In other words, the changes that only God can bring about in people who love and trust Jesus. So when we see these changes, or maybe we have them pointed out to us by other people, that can also encourage us that we are truly genuine members of God's kingdom. We might think, though, what about people who aren't in the kingdom? Does this parable not apply to them? Well, the parable of the yeast also changes the way we share Jesus with others. So as we saw with the mustard seed, the kingdom is growing. Yep, that's great news. Really great, especially for all those places where the church is growing 10 times bigger every, every couple of years. But what about here? What about our friends and our family? You might be thinking, I've tried telling them about Jesus and it's not working. As far as I can tell, it hasn't made any difference whatsoever. But God's word does amazing things when it takes root in a person's heart. For some people, it might happen overnight. For some, it might take years and years. There are some people that might never accept Jesus at all. But there are those who will. And for them, hearing God's word is like yeast. Unseen, making a difference, bringing them to a point where they can accept Jesus as Lord. If it wasn't, then none of us would be here today. I've realised this week whilst preparing that sometimes when I try and share Jesus with someone, even before I've said anything, I'm sometimes bracing myself for a negative response. A weird look or some comment like, well, that's nice for you, but not for me, thanks. And that can then stop me from sharing anything at all. But in that moment, I'm doubting, not myself, but the power of God's kingdom and his word. The power that changes and saves. So what can we do? We can pray speak and trust we pray for God's mercy he is the one who grows the kingdom we can speak we speak the gospel in love and at every opportunity that we can and we trust that God will grow his kingdom just as he's promised to and he'll continue to grow us and transform us in the meantime to be more like Jesus while we wait so The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed. Small beginnings lead to enormous growth. And the kingdom of heaven is also like yeast, with God's word working out a powerful transformation. Two amazing parables in almost as many verses. But as we finish, there's two more verses that we haven't quite touched on yet. 
And just before we finish, we're going to have a look at them. On the screen, it says, you see, Jesus spoke all these things to the crowd in parables. He didn't say anything to them without using a parable. So was fulfilled what was spoken through the prophet. I will open my mouth in parables. I will utter things hidden since the creation of the world. Now, as we've seen over this little series in the summer, Jesus speaks in parables, not just to make things memorable, they're engaging, but to divide. Either people will seek to understand and be given more, or they'll be hardened further to that message. There was roughly about 2,000 people there when Jesus was speaking at the time. But only a small number of them actually did anything about it. Some people might have thought that they were following Jesus just by turning up, but they didn't really listen. Or if they did, they forgot it very quickly afterwards. These parables contain the meaning of life, kingdom, the kingdom of heaven, things create, hidden since the creation of the world. But for a lot of people, it was just like an evening in front of the TV. Gardener's world and the bake-off. And as soon as the credits rolled, they either turned it off or just flicked it over. Ah, that was nice. Good positive message. Jesus tells a good story. What else is on? Now, if we're Christians here today, or if you're not quite sure yet, Sorry, if you're not a Christian here today, or if you're not quite sure yet, then please do consider what's on offer. It's membership in the kingdom of heaven with Jesus as king and real power to change. And if you are a Christian, let's make sure we don't underestimate what we're a part of. The kingdom of heaven is growing. It's so easy with the noise of our lives to downplay the importance of these things. We don't hear about it in the news and among friends and family it can still feel really, really small and insignificant. Even with each other, fellow members of the kingdom, sometimes we can just resort to talking about the weather or the football. I mean, they're okay to talk about, but let's also encourage each other with the growth that we're seeing in each other or share ways that we can support each other in the coming weeks. We can really be encouraged, I think, this week to go out as members of this kingdom that we're a part of, knowing it's the most important and it's also it's the only thing in history that is eternal. The kingdom of heaven is growing. And as it grows, with Jesus at the head, God's word is at work, powerfully transforming us day by day. Let's pray together as we finish. Father, thank you for these parables and the meanings they contain. Please use them to reshape our view of the world. Who's in charge, what's important, and what will last. Please, Lord, continue to grow your kingdom. We ask for your mercy on our friends and family and community who don't know you yet. And please give us courage to speak and trust to know that your word is powerful to change. Please, Lord, continue to use your word this week to change us to be like Jesus. And in his name we pray. Amen.
I'll be moved And the part 